Hey there my fellow intellectuals, today we're going to be going through a problem in electrodynamics. Specifically we're going to find the potential in the electric field a height z above a uniformly charged circle of radius r0. So how are we going to start? Well I propose we solve for v first, the potential sorry. So v stands for the potential and e stands for the electric field. So let's say find v, find v. Then we know that from electrodynamics that the negative gradient of V is equal to the electric field. And so if we just take the gradient of our potential, we will get the electric field or the, the negative gradient, I should say. So, okay, I say find V, then find E, but how do we find V in the first place? Well, if you have an arbitrary uh, source of charge, you can use this equation, V of R is equal to one divided by four pi epsilon zero, we have the charge density on top, multiplying a differential uh, volume element over R subtract R prime. Okay, now this is a lot of, um, this is a lot of letters here. This equation is from um, most electrodynamics textbooks. This one I have from Griffiths, but um, it's not as bad as you might think. So the rho of R, right, rho of R prime is the charge density and in our case, it's just going to be sigma, which is a constant, that's nice, so we can just pull it out of the integral. Now, dv prime, right, so dv prime typically would be a differential volume element, but this is, so this is a two-dimensional charge density, two-dimensional charge density, two-dimensional charge density. So we, requ we require the, um, the differential element on top to be a differential area element, dA prime. Now, why do I do that? Because if you think about it, the units of rho, right, if we just look at this equation, rho should be uh, coulombs or charge per meters cubed, and the differential volume element should give me units of meters cubed. So if you take the product of these two, so take the product of those two, you'll just get um, well, let's just do rho dv prime. That just gives you coulombs over meters cubed times meters cubed has units of coulombs. So you want something that just has units of charge or coulombs in the numerator. And so if we have a two-dimensional charge density, I need a two-dimensional differential area element, which has units of meters squared. So, okay, erase that. That's settled then. And now we should look at the uh, two vectors down here. So I'm going to use a different color here, these two vectors. So R is known as the field vector, the unprimed R. R prime is known as the source vector. So in my uh, picture here that, that we have of, of the disk, the field vector is just an arrow that points from points O to P. So we're just trying to find the vector that points from the origin to the point of interest that we're interested in, which at this case, it's just 0, 0, z because we were centering the disk at the origin. So if we're just above the point 0, 0, 0 and we go up a height z, we don't travel in the x and y direction, we're just at 0, 0, z. Now at, um, at this other r prime here, this is a vector that points from the origin to q, right? So this ve vector down here is the source vector. And we're going to give those guys some actual components in just the coming seconds. So the field vector R, right, we can think of it as the point at P. Let's just take the coordinates at point P and subtract the coordinates at the origin. Well, the coordinates at point P is just 0, 0, Z, and the coordinates at point, or the origin point, is just 0, 0, 0. So we're going to have the uh, vector 0, 0, Z. Right, so we take this vector up here, and then we subtract the uh, origin coordinates, 0, 0, 0, so we just get 0, 0, z. Now the source vector, r prime, a little bit more tricky, but if you think about um, what's happening at point q, we're just at some arbitrary point in the xy plane, because we are going to put the disk, we're, we're putting the disk at, in the xy plane, because the center of the disk is at the origin, and if it's at the origin, that means the disk must live in the xy plane. So disk, let me write this here, disk lives in xy plane, xy plane. And so the points of q is just x, 
y zero, right? Because if we're at the xy plane, we're at a uh, z level of zero, right? So there's no um, z component there, or the z component is just equal to zero. So in that case, the r prime vector is going to be x y zero. And if we take the difference of those two, we do r minus r prime, that just gives us, we just subtract these two vectors, we get negative x, negative y, and z. And finally, we need to take the magnitude of those two vectors. That's just known as the separation vector. So this is known, so this is known as the separation vector. And then the magnitude of that is just the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. So it's x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Because even if you take negative x squared and negative y squared, the, the square of negative x and the square of negative y is just going to give you positive x squared and positive y squared. So that is our denominator. So let's just write everything out. I know it's long, but here we go. V of r is equal to, uh, let's just call this a constant just so I don't have to keep writing this out because it's just a constant. K, now remember that the charge density itself is a constant. So K sigma times the integral of dA prime over, now we have the magnitude of r minus r prime. That's just going to be the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, okay? So, so far, so good. But now we're kind of stuck because we need, we need to have bounds. We want to integrate this thing over the disk. So we want to integrate over this disk here in the xy plane. We'd love to integrate over that disk. But, let me see if I can backtrack here. But, it's kind of hard to integrate uh, over this disk in Cartesian coordinates. So I propose, why don't we just switch to uh, cylindrical coordinates? So switch to cylindrical, or sorry, not cylindrical, well, polar coordinates, I should say. Not cylindrical polar, but just polar coordinates because we're not, we're not going anywhere in Z. So we'll just go to polar coordinates. Switch to polar coordinates. Okay. So if we switch to polar coordinates, remember that we have x is equal to r cosine theta, y is equal to r sine theta, and r is equal to just the square root of x squared plus y squared, okay? And if we have a differential area element, that's just equal to r dr d theta, okay? And better yet, maybe I'll write this as uh, it's okay. I think I'll just leave it like that. I think I think we'll be okay just leaving it as r dr d theta. Okay, so we're gonna rewrite our equation one more time. So if we have um, this x squared plus y squared right there, that just becomes r squared. Not too bad. And uh, let's just rewrite the equation in another color here, black again. K sigma integral. So it's a differential area element, right? So we need to integrate over r and theta, so I'll have two integral um, signs there. So let me make that a little bit nicer. I didn't really like the way that looks. So two integral signs like that. Now dA prime, like I said, is just going to be r dr d theta. We divide this by the square root of, now we have, remember x squared plus y squared is just r squared, so we have r squared plus z squared. And we have to now decide what our integration bounds are. So let's say r is equal to something, r is equal to something, theta is equal to something, theta is equal to something. So if we want to integrate in the r direction, we're just going to integrate from zero to r naught, right? So we're gonna go from zero to r naught in the r direction. And then if we want to spin around this disk, right? If you wanna spin around in this disk, we're gonna integrate theta, which is just the angle, the angular variable, and we're gonna sweep it from zero to two pi, and that's how we cover the disk, right? So we, we go to a radius r naught, and then we rotate this thing by two pi to get um, the integration over the entire disk. So, okay, so r is gonna go from zero to r naught, theta is gonna go from zero to two pi, and this is nice because the integrand does not depend on theta. If you notice, there's nothing in here that depends on theta except d theta. So if we just have the integral of d theta in, from zero to two pi, we just get a two pi factor. So V of R is equal to K sigma uh, two pi 
integral of r dr over r squared plus z squared from 0 to r naught. So remember, just remember that d theta integrated from 0 to 2 pi, that's just equal to 2 pi. So that's, where, that's why we just popped out a 2 pi out of that. Okay, so now we're at an integral that we can actually do, which is good. And we're just going to use a substitution here. So let's say uh, u equals uh, r squared plus z squared. That means du dr is equal to 2r. So du is equal to uh, 2r dr. But we don't have a 2r dr. We have a just an r dr in the numerator. So we divide this by a factor of 2. So du divided by 2 is equal to r dr. Okay. And we now have to change the uh, limits, right? Because we're no longer integrating with respect to r, we're integrating with respect to u. So if r is equal to uh, 0, then u is equal to 0 squared plus z squared, which is equal to z squared. And if r is equal to r naught, u is equal to r naught squared plus z squared. Okay, so we've gotten hopefully all of this worked out and we can just integrate this now. So let's say v of r is equal to 2 pi k sigma. Now we go from, uh, let's see, z squared to r naught squared plus z squared. And we have a du over 2, so don't forget the 1 half. I'll just put 1 half du in the numerator. And then we divide that by, by what do we have here? We have u to the one half in the denominator because u remember is r squared plus z squared and we have the square root of that in the denominator so that's why we have a u to the one half. We also have a half and my two canceling there so we just eliminate those two constants entirely. And now we just have to evaluate what this integral will be. So we have pi k sigma and we integrate this from z squared to r naught squared plus z squared and we have um, u to the minus one half du okay so chugging along here so u to the minus one half du um, so u to the minus one half du that should just give me we add one to the numerator or sorry to the exponent so we get u to the one half divided by one half that's equal to 2u to the 1 half. And then we want to evaluate this. Oop, that's a really bad 1 half. Sorry about that. So we get 2u to the 1 half. And we're going to evaluate that from z squared to r naught squared plus z squared. Okay? So I'll put the bounds here. r naught squared plus z squared. Okay. So a lot of integrating, but that's what we're here to do. So we have 2 uh, now we have r naught squared plus z squared to the one half. Sorry if I'm going in a weird direction here, but I'll put the two on the outside. Subtract um, z squared to the one half, which will just give us a power of z. Okay, so that is what we have so far. And why don't I just go ahead and uh, write that out down here. So v of r, with all the constants now, we have 2 pi k sigma, and we have quantity r naught squared plus z squared to the 1 half minus, now this just becomes z, so I have minus z. And if you want to be fancy, we can rewrite what the k was. So remember, k was, so k, let me write k. So k is equal to 1 divided by 4 pi epsilon 0. So if I erase that, that k here, and then I divide by 4 pi epsilon not 0, we'll get a 2 pi cancels with a 4 pi. So we'll have 2 there. So we get v of r is equal to sigma over 2 epsilon naught quantity uh, r naught squared plus z squared to the half subtract z. Wow, and that will be our um, 
our potential. So that's our potential function. So if we are a height z above the center of the disk, that is our potential function. So great, we have the potential. Now we just need to get the electric field. So now, so now we just need to take the gradient of v is equal to the electric field. And the nice thing about this is that v only depends on z. So notice, I'll say that notice v is only a function of z, is only a function of z, in which case that means the gradient of v, so negative del v, is just going to be the negative partial derivative of v with respect to z. So because there's no x or y component, because normally the gradient, right, normally, normally, I'll write normally, negative del v, that's just equal to the negative of dv dx i hat plus dv dy uh, j hat plus dv dz k hat. And uh, well, we just don't have, um, we just don't have a, an x or a y component in this function. So it just becomes the, uh, what you call it, the, the, the z derivative. So erasing this, hopefully fast enough, so I can get to the actual calculation of E. All right, so now we're gonna get E by taking the gradient. So negative, I'll take negative D by DZ of sigma two epsilon naught R naught squared plus Z squared to a half subtract Z. So I'm gonna be a bit careful here because I could easily mess this up and we're so close to the end that I don't wanna mess this up. So let's just take the constant outside. So we have negative uh, sigma two epsilon zero. Take the derivative of, let's see, r naught squared plus z squared to the half subtract z. And we can, um, <clears throat> we can just distribute the derivative to these two terms here. So. Uh, what we're going to have is still the negative sigma over 2 epsilon 0 d by dz. Uh, let's see here. We have r naught squared plus z squared to the half. And we have a, the derivative of z is just 1, or the minus, of minus z is just minus 1. So um, subtract 1. Okay. And let's just get this last derivative here. So if I take the derivative of this function, I should get a one half times r naught squared plus z squared to the minus one half. And we multiply that, <coughs> excuse me, by the derivative on the inside by the chain rule, which is just two z. And we still have a subtract one here. And this half cancels with that too. So what I'm left with is uh, let's see, I will distribute the minus sign inside. So we'll have uh, negative sigma over two epsilon naught. The negative one becomes a positive one. So I have one subtract, I have z over r naught squared plus z squared to the half in the denominator. And that is the electric field at the point P. And I just want to clarify one thing. I forgot to include an important part of the electric field. This is not complete without the uh, k-hat vector, because remember this was the gradient of the potential and the gradient of a scalar field is a vector field, so I need to have my component. So just remember that there is also a k-hat right here at the very end multiplying this component of the electric field. So this is the final answer that I was looking for. We found the electric field and the potential for a uniformly charged circle. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Please leave a comment and I'll see you guys next time.